Mm. Truly sweet. Well, we're closing out our July month with the Bill of Rights. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I like to play with my words. But you know, the rights, the rituals that we have in life, we do have a right to participate in those rites, in those rituals. And uh, as with so many times when I start out with my talks, I like to head to dictionary.com because it helps to know what the dang word means. <laughs> and, uh, but this thing about rites, you know, that, that rites, rituals, the ceremonial, ceremonial activities of life, those things that are prescribed by custom, that are handed down over the ages, that are established, that are, that are told to us to do to make things right, to make things fit, to make our lives uh, seem special, even in their usual moments. They're collectively joined in, um, these rites that we participate in, and some of them, as our forefathers said, are God-given, inalienable, as John reminded us a couple weeks back. And they take a lot of different forms, rituals do. And when I think about rituals, what I always like to remind people is we, we are so excited about spirituality. You know, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. Practicing spirituality. If you take that word and you look right in the middle, there it is, ritual ritual in the middle of spirituality. So it's a part of the activity of being spiritual, is to participate in ritual, in all of its various forms and activities and ways of being. Uh, there's silent ones, there's a solitary that we do in our own space uh, that are self-contained, uh, our moments of prayer, where we enter into the Father's closet in secret, that special place, and the closet, the space of your mind, where no one else can go, but you can go. Those contemplative moments when we sit and the one I shared with you, one of the most special contemplative moments of my life was when I was at Casa Maria. We know the story, some of you know my story of Mary, and sitting there in front of the Mary statue and having her come to me and say in, those, in that moment, Steve, well, she didn't say Steve, it was just a voice, but it was a clear voice, it was a clear voice. I was in contemplation and said, come and kneel and pray at my feet. And my religious science kicked in, I don't pray at the feet of Mary. <laughs> and then my religious science kicked in a second time and it said, wait a minute, you're a religious scientist. Practice this stuff called spirituality. Go over and kneel at the feet of this statue. And I did. And I prayed. And I cried for about 30 minutes. I cried the most cleansing, releasing, loving, tear-filled boo-hoo. And it was just so special. Such a special moment. And I spent the next part of my three-day silent retreat, or actually it was a five-day silent retreat, uh, going back to Mary every day. And I drove up my camper, I drove my camper up there to, to be at Casa de Maria. I didn't need the camper, I had a little hermitage where I stayed. But in it, I have all the cleaning supplies necessary for when you're camping. And so I spent the next couple of days cleaning up this statue that was outside. And it was such a wonderful experience to just be with her and to, to touch her and to, to clean the, the, the birds and the, and the weather and the life that had gone on in all those years and participate in that. But that's what those moments of, of solitary ritual can do for us. They can take us to a place I would have never known that my avatar wouldn't be Jesus, it wouldn't be Buddha, uh, it wouldn't even be Ernie, it would be Mary. You know, that that would be the guide to take me to a new level of spiritual understanding of what the depths of love and forgiveness can be all about. So those are those kind of solitary ones. But then there are the more bolsterous ones where we don't even think. They're still unitive experiences, and we may not even think of them uh, quite as, as ritual. Uh, New Year's Eve is one of those, you know. But how many of us do the New Year's Eve? You watch the ball fall from Times Square? I mean, that's a, that's a shared ritual that we don't think of in the, in the sense of what we usually think the ritual is contained within. We think it's something sacred. But the deal is that what we need to recognize is what Lama Marut said in um, Renegade's Guide to a Good Life. He says, Going through life as if everything were ordinary, just normal, is a mistake. To go through life and to think of something like New Year's Eve, not all that normal, but think it's just ordinary, is a mistake. To miss the collective energy that's going on there in that situation. Um, Super Bowl, another one. You don't think of it as ritual, but some people it is for them. I have a friend of mine who's um, 
he's not a he's he's very tickled that I'm that I'm a minister now we've been friends for like 35 years and he's always saying I can't even there, there God what's what's all this God stuff and I, I tell him I said Mark you are the most religious spiritual person I know he says, what are you talking about well like for example a friend of mine moved here from Hawaii he didn't have a car Mark had an extra car he gave the guy the car he didn't like loan him the car he he gave him the car you know uh, if people needed money he would loan it to them if somebody needed a ride to the airport he would take them you know this guy's heart is so big he I never tried this but I bet he would help you move you know this so when his wife came to me and says I'm just so bummed that he won't come to church with me he just wants to sit home and watch football I was going do you realize what a spiritual experience that is first off he's not invested in either team he doesn't own the team he's not going to get anything from it but he roots he puts all of his heart and his soul into hoping that the, that it will be not only just a good game and a great performance for the players but that one side would, would actually win he, he roots for them you know he puts his heart into it and his soul into it even something like a, a football game can be a ritual experience and you can find the sacred when you can see that it's bigger than just what we would normally think of as the ordinary game. My mom likes Super Bowls too. She used to have a Super Bowl party every year, but her favorite was the Rose Parade and the Rose Bowl party and because we were in the Big Ten and she, and she loved to root against the Pac-10. She was very troubled when I decided to take some classes at USC. That just was not good for her. <laughs> She taught me another one of my favorite uh, contemplative activities. When we were kids, she would climb trees. She loved to climb trees. And she would have me climb trees with her. And we would sit up in these trees, and we would watch the ants in the tree or just watch the leaves. Ants are very industrious creatures. They're just like critters up that tree and working and just working in teams and helping each other and carrying so much weight, much more weight than their bodies could even seem to hold. They're super, they're super animals, you know, super incredible. And you never even notice that kind of stuff until you stop for a minute. She taught me the joy of just stopping and sitting and listening to the wind blowing through the trees. You can turn every experience in your life into a very special ritual if you just remember that it's not ordinary. But so frequently when we're thinking about ritual, we do think about the container of spirituality. We're holding it in that container of spirituality. And it's because it helps us to find our place, you know. Joseph Campbell loves the idea of ritual and myth. He talks about it a lot. One of the things he says is that we live in a deep and sacred mystery that cannot be fully understood intellectually, but can be experienced when we open ourselves to the flow of life in and through us. We live in this myth. And the myth is a collective dream that we all share in, that we make happen. It's not something fake, it's something real. It's not a lie, it's the truth. And when we live in the truth of the myth of who we really are, we open ourselves up into a, a deeper wisdom. See, that wisdom is contained within the myth. That wisdom is contained in the stories that we share. Uh, it's so interesting that there are so many creation stories in the various faith systems throughout the world. There are flood stories in the various creation systems without the, throughout the world. There's something about our relationship to water and how water can birth us into something new that's very powerful. So it's not just by accident that, that John the Baptist spent time dunking people in the river. He, it, there's this energy that we get from water. Johanna and I went to the beach yesterday and just sitting there and just watching the waves. And I went down and I just stood on the shore and I let the movement of the waves just bury my feet. You know that, that motion where they just, the water takes you deeper into the sand each time and you just get to the point where you're like, whoa, you're doing like the Michael Jackson lean. You can do it because your feet are anchored in the soil, you know? And that that anchoring of your feet into the soil, what a metaphor for life. If we can live and have our horizon, you know, have your horizon out on the distance. You know, my eyes were out looking out at the horizon, so I was floating with the sky and watching the sunset, and my feet were anchored in the soil of the earth at the same time. It seems like I was soaring and I was planted all at once. That's the energy that we can get from turning something as simple as going into the beach as a ritual experience, as a rich experience of life. It helps us make sense of the complex world when we deal with ritual. Turning everyday experiences into something special is what it's all about. Now, I've been reading a lot about this with uh, a guy named Robert Fulgham. You know him? He's the one, everything I needed to know I learned in life in kindergarten. But he's got another book called From Beginning to End. And uh, in it, he, he starts the book out sitting in the graveyard. He bought his plot early in life. And so he goes there on a regular basis and just sort of sits 
<laughs> Whatever floats your boat, dude. But I guess he won because I bought his book. <laughs> so I'm reading this thing, but here's, what he, here's this revelation he got from that. He was there one evening and waited for the sun to set, and he realized from where he was going to be into eternity, there was this really great view, and he's looking up at the stars, and I'd never thought about this before. You know, the stars, the light that you're seeing, well, I've thought about it, but not in this way. The light that you see from the stars left that star light years before you were there to experience it, you know? And the light that we see reflected from the moon coming off the sun, that light that left the sun eight some odd minutes ago, you know, that light is going to be traveling, like our light will be traveling way off into the future. You know, it's a moment looking at the stars, looking at the sun, suddenly turned into an experience of eternity because that light's been traveling for so long and my light is going to be like that. It's going to travel for a long time, long after I'm gone. Your light will travel for a long time after you're gone. Every moment of our life offers us an opportunity, if we can turn it into the sacred and turn it into a ritual experience, offers us an opportunity to get that much deeper and to find ourselves, to find out who we really are, and to make sense of our life in the world. I just realized I gave that to Joseph Campbell and that was Carol Huntley in her Real Life Rituals book. Because Joseph Campbell has a similar quote. It's much longer. I should have known better. <laughs> now, somebody might be thinking, this stuff's not ritual he's talking about. So it's just habits. That's just what we do. And sometimes our habits do uh, lose their sacredness. The, the habit of waking up in the morning, and I've talked about this a couple weeks ago, the habit of uh, having readings. You know, I have my morning readings. I don't know if you have your morning readings. Whatever your morning habit is. It can be a routine, but it can also be a ritual if you could stop and allow the sacred to flow through it, you know? And so having this week, this month of talking about freedom and talking about liberty and talking about being present to who and really and what I really am has allowed me to deepen in my spiritual practice, to go from the habit of it to going, okay, here's my readings, <laughs> check, got that done, next, into really stopping and sucking up the words, you know, and sitting with it and holding the book. I love books. I mean, I, I got a bunch of books on my Kindle here, but I love the holding of the book and the turning of the page and the, the way the page smells and getting my highlighter out. And I've just been spending time with the word and turning these what were routine moments into ritual moments to deepen and find out more about who I really am. The Celtic practice and lifestyle is so rich. You know, I was reading um, Adam Cara, John, Don John O'Donohue's book, and he talks about the Gaelic practice, uh, the Gaelic language doesn't have, apparently, doesn't have the word hello in it. What they say for hello is uh, God is with you, and what they say for goodbye is may God be with you. The whole experience of you coming into the presence of another person is a ritual experience in which they bring in the flavor of God in that moment. It's like the namaste thing that we said a minute ago, I see the God in you. That activity of just saying hello. Think about how rich your relationships will be with every person that you see. If when you see them, you see them as, I see God with you. And when you let them walk away from you, if you send God away with them, may God be with you. That turns that whole conversation, even if you argue, it turns that whole conversation into a ritual experience. And arguing, I mean, some of our, some of our prophets in the Old Testament had a great time arguing with God. That's a long tradition of arguing with God. So there's no problem when a friend comes and you have a little argument with them. That's just you and God having an exchange of deepening about who you really are. It's okay. Just so long you don't hold it in and let it go after it's over with, right? You gotta let this stuff go. But I just love that idea of God is with you and God, may God keep you. You know, we see these rituals in so many different other ways, too, these rites of passage that we, that we partake in. Of course, there's the, the regular ones that we know about, quinceañeras and bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs and, and sweet 16 parties and graduations. But I never really thought about gender nights, like poker night with the guys, you know? 
Uh, it's like when the guys would get around the campfire and dance a little bit before they go out hunting. You know, we have to, those, those, those moments of richness, you know, the sewing circle. I know, don't get all sexist on me about this kind of stuff, but I'm just talking about these ideas when women get together with women and when men get together with women. I know, uh, with men. I know that we're... <laughs> Hey, I'm young. What are you going to say? <laughs> so, but those, those moments, there's such richness. There's such richness even in that too. And I'm mentioning all these things because I want you to, to get to the space. My inv invitation for you is to get to the space where you see every moment of your life as a sacred moment. And when you see every activity of your life as a, as a sacred activity. You know, there's a book called, uh, what's his name, Iliad, uh, Marcia Iliad, wrote this book called The Sacred and the Profane. There is, no, there is no sacred and profane. It's all sacred, you know? It's all sacred. There, in our teaching, we say there's one life. That life is God. That life is my life now. Always add that that life is my life now so you can join yourself into this experience of life. But if that's true, there can't be this duality. There's only the oneness. The duality, duality is only here to allow us to have the human experience. But that human experience is happening within the one. And if we can see that, it makes every single day a little bit richer, a little bit more joyous, a little bit more fun. Dr. Holmes says, we must come in quiet confidence with an open and receptive mind, a believing heart, naturally, sanely, and expectantly. If you want to enter into your days with that open-heartedness, with that believing, receptive mind, be it sane and expectantly. Okay, not always sane. Sometimes insane is kind of fun. But if you want to go into it from that space, Ritual allows you to do that. Seeing all your activities as something sacred and special allows you to do that, allows you to open yourself up to more joy. <laughs> when I first moved to Austin, Texas, uh, I lived with my Aunt Pokey, and uh, her name was Louise, but I called her Pokey, and I thought it was because of the way she drove, but that turned out to be a mistake. <laughs> it had nothing to do with the way she drove. I, she didn't even like stoplights. <laughs> it was like... That's a red light. I know, it's good. <laughs> Boom! It's like, oh, God, am I going to make it from the airport to her house? And the craziness didn't stop there. I get to her house, and she lives with her mom. Pokey was 70. Her mom was 88. And Alice loved to watch the baseball game. And as far as she was concerned, that was a two-way television. And she would have these conversations with the ball players. She would tell them when to hit and when to run. And she was the coach. It was awesome. But for her, that was it. The baseball season was that was her ritual experience. And she was in front of that thing, and it kept her alive. And her friend, her friend Joe Gibson would come over. And for them, remembrance, remembrance was the was the game. He could, he was a man. He was a poker. It was 1935. You were wearing a red dress. You came in, the sun was shining through, and you said, and she would go, that's exactly right. I don't know how these guys could remember this kind of stuff. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think part of it is that when you get really, really old, you say the memory with such enthusiasm and vigor and confidence that you believe it actually is true. <laughs> Sanely, right? It doesn't always have to be sane. But those experiences are really rich and the joy that they would have in those experiences. So I just want to keep, keep saying that for you because what Robert, Robert Fulgham does say is that these rituals, these activities, they satisfy us in ways that our spirit understands but our mind cannot. So when we leave these different activities, we feel so good. And like, why? Well, because they tap into that deeper wisdom. They tap into that thing that we sometimes forget when we, we're busy worried about the guy who cut us off in the carpool lane, which happened this morning. It took a long time to get let that go, but we finally did, you know? Special moments. <laughs> Special moments. See, we're talking about a joining with the one. Moments of atonement, at one -ment. 
to see the celebrations of life that come to us in circles and in cycles. We celebrate the turning of the seasons. We celebrate the anniversaries and the birthdays and the, and the weddings and, 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 all, and the graduations and all of these cycles of life, these circles that life keeps rotating through and through and through. If we can see that from this special place that I'm talking about and know that it is our right to experience these rights in the most wonderful way, in the most joyous way, it just lights us up and it makes life so much more fun. And there's Joseph Campbell. Here you are. A ritual is the enactment of a myth. That's what I wanted to get to. And by participating in the ritual, you are participating in the myth. When you participate in the ritual, you're participating in a collective consciousness idea and allowing that idea to find form in your life. Your consciousness, I love the way he's done this and split this word. Your consciousness is being reminded of the wisdom of your own life reminded when you're you know it's it's in your mind already it's kind of like going to the apple store and dropping off your computer at the genius bar and coming back and it's all updated and looking right for you again it's being reminded or for you uh pc people it's when you hit the button that says update but (laughs) (laughs) to be reminded of the wisdom of your own life and the other thing i love about this particular quote is the wisdom is already in you The wisdom's already in us. We just sometimes forget. The rituals give us a chance to remember. And perhaps through some of the different examples I've given today, it won't necessarily be the ritual of prayer or the ritual that is more um, contained by the idea of what you think a ritual is. Perhaps it will be expanded so that all of your life can offer opportunities for you to see how special each every moment is and in that specialness get the remembrance of your connection to spirit of your connection to life itself of your connection to the stars that you're seeing something that started long before you and something that will pass long after you and so we're in the middle of this unified experience of beingness you know and that's 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 nice that's rich that's fun One of the things I like to do, I mean, we did it with my men's group. My men's group actually is called Anamkara too, which means soul friends. And we've been meeting together for about seven, about eight years now. And every month we get together to do a, a spiritual practice. And our monthly spiritual practice begins with a ritual. The ritual is to sit down and dine together, you know, and that's a start. And what a wonderful ritual we all do that. How many of you say, say grace before your meals? still kind of an old-fashioned thing, right? Well, if you're not a grace sayer before your meals, it's nice to give thanks. And if you don't want to spend a lot of time on it, I'm happy to share with you my Auntie Ruth Grace. It's, hey, God, us again, still grateful, let's eat. It's quick, <laughs> it's easy, it's to the point. Hey, God, us again, still grateful, let's eat. So if you're not a grace sayer, now you got a grace you can say real quick and easy. You don't have to get all crazy about it and spend a lot of time with it. But we sit down together and we break bread. And breaking bread is a powerful ritual that we all experience. You invite your friends over for dinner, for meals. What a wonderful time that is, right? Food, mm, great unifier, right? And then we share stories. We get current. We share what's going on in our lives. Next to being on your phone in the dark, laying down on your back when you're a teenager, talking to your best friend, sitting over a meal and sharing your stories is one great way to get intimate with someone. So we do that. Then we go outside and we sage, you know? And then we do a spiritual practice each month. And that, that idea is something that has held us together for a really long time. Like I said, eight years. And last month what we did was we played my first time. To look back, the first time I heard so-and-so, the first time I danced, the first time I rode my motorcycle, the first time I drove a car, the first time remembrance is a wonderful exchange to get a conversation started, a great ritual practice you can do with your friends to start out Uh, in making these things happen. Thinking about the music and playing the music of your past. Somewhere I was reading, and I love this phrase, that the music of of our high school and college years plays forevermore in the ballroom of our minds. That's sweet, the ballroom of our minds. What's playing in the ballroom of your minds? And when you hear that music from the ballroom of your mind, share it with a friend. 
you know, sharing stories. And perhaps after this, you may even share stories with each other about little rituals that you do in your own life. And maybe somebody will go, oh, that's interesting. That reminds me of something that we used to do in our family. And that's how we expand our community and s expand our sharing of that myth, of that collective dream that we all share in together. I bet that if I did the let's make a deal thing and, so, and, and opened up your wallet or looked in your purse or even on your wrist or around your neck, I would find a ritual taking place. My grandmother wore this. This is a picture of my son when we were at, at a park or uh, this, this bracelet I got from a friend, the, the, the uh, what are those, the charms that are hanging from the bracelet represent my grandkids. We, we carry our rituals with us on a regular basis and sometimes don't even rea realize it through the talismans in our lives, you know. Or maybe you have an altar at home that has some of those things or maybe your altar is something that you don't even think of as an altar. Maybe it's just the mantle on the fireplace that has pictures of the family or maybe up going up the steps all the pictures are up the family, you know. I have a friend that has pictures all over the steps up his, ham up his house and every time I'd go to his house I would take each picture and I would tilt it so that it would be on the angle with the railing <laughs> as opposed to with the steps. And then I'd get home like, Rambo! <laughs> yeah, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> Osho says, don't allow your life to become just a dead ritual. Let there be, let there be moments, that's a B, let there be moments unexplainable. Let there be moments unexplainable. And the joy that I got out of that one is that, you know, we try to make sense of everything that we do, but sometimes it doesn't need to make sense. Remember the earlier one that your mind doesn't know, but something in you knows? Maybe it's to remind us about something that, that's in us that knows. Maybe the ritual is just a little silly that you do, that you participate in, that takes you to a place where you can remember that it's your right to exercise your rights that your Bill of Rights is your individual expressions that allow you to feel deeper, to feel a part of something larger. And in feeling a part of something larger, strange. Your world can get smaller in the sense that it gets more intimate and more close and more connected. And you feel a part of something really, really big. So exercise your Bill of Rights, share your stories. Let me hear some of your stories. Let's get some rituals going, like we're going to have when we have Family Day coming up in September. We're going to have our own rituals that we're beginning. And when we have Inspire Choir Day four times a year, and have Marianne come back, and all this kind of stuff. But we're going to slowly do these kinds of things, and I invite you to do that for yourself. Enjoy your Bill of Rights. So join me now as we do our affirmation together. Here we go on three, one, two, and... In times of silent reflection and moments of sacred gathering, I remember, I remember I am divine, I am whole, I am. Mm -hmm. <sighs> okay. Just uh, allowing all the week's activities to come to heart here. Thank you, Johanna. Had a moment with the practitioners this morning in the prayer room. Powerful energy going on in the prayer room as they take your prayers and know the truth about your life that you may have forgotten that you want shared in prayer. And we invite you to, if you have a prayer card, you want to put it in the basket as it goes by, or if you want to wait and put it in the box, which will be right outside. And our practitioners will pray over that throughout the week. And if you need a call, someone can call you as well, and we'll know your truth and make it real in your life through the power of prayer. So join me now as I know this truth for each and every one of us. And what I'm knowing in my own mind, I'm knowing is the truth for your life or the life of the one that you are holding in your heart in this moment. The life that begins in and lives through and as the one life that is God. So I feel that presence right now within me animating my very being. And I know that same presence animates the being of each and every one of us that we are spirit incarnate, that we are divine emanations of the only thing that is. 
this presence, this great somethingness that is so vast, so immense, yet so loving that it has given of itself so that you, each and every one of us, may have the experience of life. So feeling completely unified with this idea and knowing that there is no place for me to go because I am already in the only place that is, which is life. I express this truth for each and every one of us, that there is perfect right action in all our lives, that we are filled with harmonious experiences, that love animates everything that we do, that peace flows through all of our relationships, through all of our circumstances, that where there is the appearance of lack, limitation, disharmony, judgment, for in, lack of forgiveness, right now those are vanished, vanquished into the nothingness from which they came. They float up into the bright light of the Spirit and burn away to have no more effect on our lives. And what rains down upon us is wealth, prosperity, joy, harmony, peace, love, a voice that guides a presence that leads, an energy that enthuses us with a purpose of well-being, a sense of well-being, a, a purpose that is directive, constructive, uplifting, and enhancing. This is the truth for each and every one of us. We remember these words spoken no matter what the condition in our lives that comes up to take us off center, we remember these words in that moment and again find our center and move from that out into a beautiful experience of life. This is the truth for each and every one of us. I know it, I feel it, I affirm it now. And join me as we release this prayer into law by saying, and so it is.